when taking a photo the cameraman simply pushes a button and then comes a flash have you ever wondered how this photo flash comes about well the photo flash is possible because of the storehouse of energy we shall call a capacitor this device we are calling a capacitor is a storehouse of energy which releases the energy quickly during the short period of the flash in this tutorial we get to explore this device called the capacitor thanks for tuning in this is Kisembo Academy. Now what exactly is a capacitor? It is simply a passive two terminal device which is used to temporarily store electrical charge. In our diagram here we have a diagram of a capacitor. These are the two terminals we are talking about. Now these two terminals are connected to two conductive plates. There is that plate that we are seeing on the top. There is that place that we are the plate at the bottom. And uh, in between is an insulator and this insulator is what we are calling the dielectric now the dielectric material can either be air it can either be paper or it can even be oil and then also these metal plates can either be square they can be circular they can be rectangular or they can even be cylindrical all depending on its application and the voltage rating uh, voltage rating this is the cross-sectional view of the basic structure of a capacitor, this being the dielectric and the two plates we are talking about. And then this is a schematic diagram. This is how it appears, the symbol, when you're drawing it in an electric circuit. So let's look at how we charge this capacitor. Now here, when we are charging a capacitor, we are having this diagram here that, we, that will become the basis on our, for our explanations on how we charge and discharge a capacitor. In this, we have a resistor, we have an ammeter, we have the capacitor here, we have the source of voltage, which we've labeled V0. Then we have a switch. This switch key can either be connected to terminal 1 or terminal 2. When it is connected to terminal 1, it would mean that the circuit is like that. So it would mean that if switch key is connected to terminal 1, it means this lower part of the circuit is out. Then if we connected this switch key to terminal 2, it would mean this upper part of the circuit is out. And we only have this, that one down. So we are going to look at how both work out. When we want to charge this capacitor, it means we are going to connect it to terminal 1 so that it gets charged. It gets its charge charged with uh, electrons being put. It gets charged when it is connected to terminal 1 because... It's in the upper circuit that we are having a source voltage. Now if you want to discharge this capacitor, we will connect it to terminal 2 and it will get discharged. Now let's exactly explain what happens during the charging process and the discharging process. So we will begin with the charging process. The charging process is when we connect switch K to terminal 1. And that is it's, it's what we have here. This is switch K according to our diagram. Switch K has been connected to terminal 1, that's it. This is the switch K we are talking about. It has been connected to terminal 1, and so that means that the lower circuit is out of the picture. Explaining the charging process. Now, electrons flow from the negative terminal of the battery, which is that one, to this plate Y. Why do they flow? Of course, this being negative terminal, uh, the electrons will be repelled. And when they are repelled, it means they are going to concentrate on this plate, and so this plate Y will become negatively charged. Likewise, this being a positive terminal of the battery, it is going to attract electrons from this plate X. And so electrons will be attracted towards place the, the, the positive terminal and leaving an excess of positive charges here. So it means that plate X becomes positively charged, plate Y becomes negatively charged. Now, as these charges accumulate on these plates, the potential difference across these, uh, these plates starts increasing. Now, when the, as the potential difference across these plates increases, the amount of current that is going to be flowing through the ammeter also starts decreasing. So, it, it is such that when the potential difference across this plate increases to the point whereby the PD across these plates of the capacitor is equivalent to the PD across the cell, then it would mean that this capacitor has been fully charged 
and so there will be no flow of electrons I mean the flow of electrons will cease this is explained in our graph of current against time when we look at this graph of our current against time initially the current is very high the flow of electrons or the, the, the current from the cell is very high but as the charging process continues the amount of current goes on decaying as the potential difference across the plates of this capacitor gets on increasing so the current decreases up to zero so it means that at this point in time at this point it means that uh, the potential difference across the plates of the capacitor is equivalent to the potential difference or the EMF of that cell and so at that point the charging of this capacitor has been complete and so no current flows let's look at how the potential difference across the capacitor plates varies with time when we are charging this capacitor the PD across the plates of this capacitor at first is zero so as the charging continues the PD across this capacitor increases and as it increases it reaches the maximum it reaches the maximum voltage and the charging stops the charging gear is going to be the, 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 the capacitor will be fully charged when the potential difference across this cell is equivalent to the EMF of that cell and that is and at that point current stops flowing the, the ammeter is no longer deflecting meaning current is not flowing anymore now let's explain the discharging process looking at the discharging process we are now connecting switch K previously switch K was being connected to point 1 now we are connecting switch K to terminal 2 that is what we are seeing here switch K is being connected to terminal 2 when switch K has been connected to terminal 2 remember in this part of the circuit there is no source of EMF we are just having two plates that are charged that are being connected to a resistor and to some circuit so when that happens it means electrons are going to flow from plate Y and they will flow to come and discharge this plate X so what does that mean it means that the potential difference across the capacitors at first is very high but as these electrons flow from plate Y to come to discharge or to neutralize plate X it means that the potential difference across this capacitor will decrease when the potential difference across this capacitor decreases it means that this capacitor is also going to lose its energy so that is how it gets discharged looking at the current also flowing through this this uh, ammeter at first is high when the electrons are traveling to come and discharge the X plates but as time goes on the current decays to zero and when the current that is flowing through the ammeter decays to zero it would mean that uh, the capacitor has been fully discharged let's look at how these parameters vary on the graph looking at the voltage against time we said that during the discharging process at first when we connect switch K to 2 the voltage is very high then these electrons start flowing to come and neutralize the positive charges on the X plate so when that happens the voltage starts dropping up to when it, the, the, the voltage decays to zero and when the voltage decays to zero it means that the capacitor has been completely discharged let's examine the how current is going to vary during the discharging process now during the discharging process when the voltage again uh, across this is too high it's going to mean that the current that is going to flow will be high at first but then as time goes on it's the current is going to be very high but this flow of current is in the opposite direction remember previously during the charging process if this is the flow of electrons it means that our current flows in the opposite direction to flow of electrons so current was flowing in that direction through the ammeter it was entering the ammeter from this side moving like that the flow of current that is charging now when we changed the terminals and we connected it to terminal 2 that is now during the discharging process 
it means that the electrons on this plate are going to travel in this direction meaning current will travel in the opposite direction so it means that when we are plotting our work in uh, according to our graph the current is first going to be high but it is traveling in the negative direction that's why the graph is at the negative part but then as these electrons move and continue to neutralize this split it will decay to zero so that's all about the discharging process of a capacitor r times c is going to give us a certain constant we are going to call the time constant now this constant is what categorizes or it what characterizes the rate of charging and discharging of the capacitor so it means that if r or the resistance that is in the circuit is small or if the capacitance of the capacitor in the circuit is small it means that the, this constant here is going to be small and if that constant is small it means that uh, the rate of charging and discharging of the capacitor will be faster if the resistance is very high and all the capacitance is also very high it means that if we multiply those two it's going to give us a time constant that is very high so when the time constant is very high it go, it's going to simply mean that the rate of charging and discharging of that capacitor is going to also be it's going to be slow in our previous tutorial we introduced the capacitor a temporary energy storage device the measure of its capacitance to store a charge is what we shall refer to as capacitance and that's what we shall discuss in this tutorial along with other factors affecting capacitance of a capacitor it's Kisembo Academy and thanks for tuning in now the capacitor as you know it has the capacity to store energy in form of an electric charge thereby producing a potential difference across its plates so you, you can think of a capacitor as more like um, a, a small rechargeable battery by applying a voltage to a capacitor and measuring the charge on the plates the ratio of the charge which we shall call Q to the voltage or what you will call the potential difference will give you the capacitance value of the capacitor and is therefore given as a capacitance is going to be equal to Q which is the charge on the plates on either plates of the capacitor divide that by the potential difference across the plates of the capacitor the property of a capacitor to store a charge on its plates in form of an electrostatic field is called the capacitance of a capacitor now although sometimes we may say that these charges or the energy of that is stored by the capacitor is stored on the plates of the capacitor but it would be it is more realistic it is more truthful to say that actually the energy is stored within the field between the plates of the capacitor that's where the actual energy is stored so by definition we can say that capacitance is defined as being the ratio of the magnitude of the charge on either plates of a capacitor to the potential difference or the PD across the capacitor or you can say that capacitance is the electrical property of a capacitor and is the measure of the capacitor's ability to store an electrical charge on its two plates and uh, looking at this we know that capacitance is going to be Q Q is measured in coulombs the SI unit for voltage is volts the SI unit for capacitance is farads and we know that one farad is going is one coulomb per volt so in other words if you are to define what exactly a farad is uh, you would say that a farad or one farad is the capacitance of a capacitor when charged with one coulomb with the potential difference across its plates being one volt so we get to look at the factors that are affecting capacitance of a capacitor we have basically three factors that affect the capacitance of a capacitor we'll discuss them one by one we have the first one being the distance of separation between the plates we have the area of overlap and then the permittivity of the dielectric if we're looking at we shall use this illustration we have a source of PD here we have two plates we have we we'll call this plate P and plate Q this plate is connected to a gold leaf electroscope and we are going to use the gold leaf electroscope to tell us the charge 
it will be a measure to tell us whether the capacitance uh, on the, the charge on this plate is increasing or decreasing. If the charge on this plate increases by show of divergence of this uh, gold leaf electroscope, it would mean that the capacitance has also increased and vice versa. This D shows the distance of separation between the two plates. So we shall begin with uh, the distance of separation between the two plates. How does that affect the capacitance of a capacitor? Now we set up our diagram here and what we have this plate P and plate Q with the distance of separation D in between them. So what happens is that when we try to bring the plates together, it means we are reducing the value of D. So when we incre reduce the value of D or when the plates are brought together, it, mean, it, it means that uh, the, the, uh, experimentally, the gold leaf electroscope, the leaves of the gold leaf electroscope will diverge, meaning that there is more charge that has, is accumulating on this plate as a result of bringing the plates together. So what does this mean? It means that when the value of D is decreasing or when you bring the plates together, it means that the capacitance of this capacitor is increasing. Likewise, if you take those plates apart, and you try to pull them across apart this gold leaf will drop the divergence of this gold leaf will draw which is a sign that when you increase the distance of separation between the plates the capacitance of the capacitor will drop so it brings us to the conclusion that the capacitance of a parallel cap plate capacitor is inversely proportional to the distance between the plate or the separation of the plates so that is one factor that affects the capacitance of the capacitor and that is the relation we get out of it. We'll get a look at the other factor, the area of overlap. This is a piece of paper and this is another piece of paper of different color. So it means that the area of overlap, this demonstration serves to illustrate what I mean by area of overlap. Looking at your screen are two papers that are overlapping each other. In this case, we assume that these two papers are two plates of the capacitor P and Q. When they overlap each other, the area of overlap is what you see as the region that is darker in the middle of the two overlapping papers. So when the darker region increases in area, it means that the area of overlap has increased and vice versa. So relating this to the capacitor plates P and Q, if you move the two plates relative to each other, the area of overlap will vary. An increase in area of overlap will cause the gold foil in the gold leaf electroscope to increase, which means an increase in capacitance. And a decrease in the area of overlap will mean a decrease in the divergence of the gold foil and therefore a decrease in the capacitance of the capacitor. This simply means to us, this simply brings us to the conclusion that the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor is directly proportional to the area of overlap. If we introduce a dielectric in between the plates of the capacitor, it's going to increase the capacitance of that capacitor. And if we do not increase, if we do not introduce a dielectric in between the plates, it's simply going to mean that the, the, the capacitance of the plate will be less. Let's examine the effect of a dielectric on the capacitance of a capacitor or a parallel plate capacitor. Now when we put a dielectric between a parallel plate capacitor into the gaps of a parallel plate capacitor, how does this dielectric affect the capacitance? Now here we are having a capacitor with two plates. This is a negatively charged plate and this is a positively charged plate. There is no dielectric in between the plates. So it means that in between the plates there is a field and this field is acting in that direction and we have called that field EO, E subscript O, that's the field between the plates. Now we are going to introduce a dielectric in between these two plates. Now when we introduce a dielectric or an insulator in between the plates, what happens? Initially, uh, this dielectric has got its molecules inside it that are random but then when we introduce these molecules into this field e naught these molecules are going to be polarized 
So when they are polarized, you'll find that near the surface of the dielectric, the surface that is next to the positive plate, we shall have uh, molecules that are polarized in such a way that we are having a negative, negative terminal. Negative electrons will be attracted at this end. Likewise, on the port, on the on the negative plate, near the surface, we'll have positive charges. On the surface of the dielectric. So what does this mean? It means that we are having now two fields. The first, the, we have a field that is due to the plates, and then now we are having a field that is being brought about by the polarization of the dielectric. But the field that is being brought about by the polarization of the dielectric is acting in the opposite direction to the field due to the plates. How? We all know that the field moves from positive to negative. This is the positive plate, that's the negative plate. And so the field due to the plate is going to move from this direction in that direction. And we are calling that field E0. But then when we introduce the dielectric into the, into the, in between the plates, and we, we find that this positive induces a negative charge, negative charges on the surface of this of this dielectric as a result of polarization of the molecules inside the dielectric. Likewise, this negative is going to induce a positive charge on the surface of the dielectric. So it means that you're having a dielectric that is polarized with a negative on the surface this way and the positive on the surface that way. So what does that mean? It means that there's going to be a field that is created inside, in between the plates, which we are calling EP. But this field is acting in the opposite direction to this one, the field due to the plates. Because this EP is from positive to negative, so the field acts in that direction. So what does that mean? It means that we are having two fields. We are having a field acting in that direction. We are having another field in the same space that is acting in the opposite direction. So it means at the end of the day we are going to get a resultant field uh, as a result of these two. So the resultant field we get after this field cancels out with that one is going to be less than the actual field that is supposed to be here. So how this, does this affect the capacitance of this capacitor? That's what we seek to explore. We see that the field due to the plates E0 minus the field due to the, due to the polarization of the molecules, which we are calling EP, is going to give us an effective and a resultant field ER. Of course, this effective field ER will be less, much less. So, after getting that effective field ER, which is much less, from the equation for intensity of the parallel plate capacitor, E is going to be V over D. Uh, getting the voltage here, making V the subject of the formula, we know that the voltage is going to be equal to E times D. Now since E is going to reduce, since the effective, redu the, the, the effective field or the effective intensity is going to reduce, it means that the value of V will reduce. I mean if you look at this expression, the voltage between the plates is going to be equal to the intensity E times D. And we are having the intensity reducing because of this. So when the intensity reduces, it means that the amount of voltage between the plates is also going to reduce. So when V also reduces, how does that affect the capacitance? We know that capacitance is the charge per unit potential difference across the plates, like we have seen here. Capacitance C is going to be the charge per unit PD. Now if this value of V has reduced, it means that it's going to increase the value of C. So since V reduces, capacitance will automatically increase. And so that is how the capacitance is affected by the dielectric. So meaning that if you introduce the dielectric in between the plates of a parallel plate capacitor, it's going to increase the capacitance. And that brings us to that conclusion that the capacitance of a capacitor C will increase with the existence of a dielectric. So the three factors will bring us to this relation that capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor is inversely proportional to the distance between the two plates but it will be directly proportional to the area 
of overlap between the plates and it will also be directly proportional to the permittivity of the dielectric that has been introduced in between. And that brings us to that relationship which has been, these are the three factors that affect the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. The direct electrode constant, the area, and the plate separation. In our next video, in our next story, we shall look more into the capacitance of your parallel plate capacitor and uh, with a specific interest on how we arrive at this expression arithmetically. We said that Gauss theorem simply states that the total flux that is passing normally through any closed surface, whatever its shape, is always equal to Q over E. That's the flux we're talking about. It states that the total flux passing normally through any closed surface, whatever its shape, is always equal to Q over E, where Q is the total charge and E is the permittivity. Now, we can express Gauss theorem in terms of surface charge density. This is Gauss theorem. We can also express it in terms of surface charge density. How? We know that flux is, is equivalent to the intensity of the field multiply that by the area through which the field is going. This area has to be normal to the field. And uh, if the area is not normal to the field, then we're supposed to resolve the field to the normal or to the perpendicular line that is going through the area like we earlier described. So flux is the intensity times the area and that's going to be equal to the charge times divide that by the permittivity. Now dividing area on both sides so that we have the intensity on one side we have A coming down here. But then we know that the charge per unit area is what we know as charge density denoted by that so in simple terms this intensity can also be equal to charge density divide that by permittivity now finding the expression whereby you are having intensity is equal to charge density divide that by permittivity this is actually coming from Gauss theorem capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor now, for us to get the expression for the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor, we are going to get that from Gauss theorem. And from Gauss theorem, it's where we get this expression that E is going to be equal to the charge density, divide that by the permittivity. But we know, uh, but surface charge, but surface, uh, but surface charge, de but the surface, which is the charge density, or we know that the charge density, which is this, this is surface charge density. But we know that the surface density or the charge density on the surface of these plates is equivalent to the charge on those plates, which is Q, divide that by the area, as shown here. The surface charge density is equal to Q over the area. So we, we substitute this in that expression. So when we substitute this here, it means that our value of E is still going to be Q over A, which is that one, the surface charge density, divide that by the permittivity of the field, which is that. So we'll end up with our expression for intensity E, which is going to be equal to Q, which is the charge on either plate, divide that by the permittivity times the area on the, the, the surface area of the plates. But since we're dealing with parallel plate capacitors, we know that the intensity of two parallel plate capacitors E is equivalent to the PD between the plates over their separation, V over D. So we are supposed to substitute for the value of E, we put V over D. Because this is how, this is the expression for intensity. This is the expression for the intensity of the field between two parallel plates. And we also know that for capacitors, the amount of charge that is residing between two capacitors is equivalent to the product of the capacitance Multiply that by the potential difference between the two capacitors. So Q is equal to CV, we substitute it there. So when we substitute this here and this one there, we end up with an expression that has gotten C in it. So substituting gas gives us an expression with C in it. And when we make C the subject of the formula, 
we come up with C being equal to permittivity times the uh, cross-sectional area, divide that by the distance of separation between the two plates. And this is the formula or the expression we use when we are trying to find the permittivity, when we are trying to find the capacitance of a power of plate capacitor. The formula you're seeing on your screen is the formula we use when we are trying to find the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. And we said that capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor is equivalent to the permittivity. Multiply that by the cross-sectional area of the plate, the area of either plate. Divide that by the distance between the two capacitors. Now, we have two capacitors here. We have a capacitor that does not have a dielectric between it. It's, it splits and we have a capacitor that has got dielectric between the plates. Now we said that another dielectric is an insulator and it can either be water, it can be oil, it can be air. But that is a dielectric for you. Now, if we got the, using the previous formula, if we got the capacitance, we, we can calculate the capacitance of this capacitor. We can also calculate the capacitance of that capacitor without the dielectric. Now, when we get the capacitance of those two capacitors and we find their ratio, we are going to get a terminology we shall call the relative permittivity. Now, what is relative permittivity? It is simply the ratio of the capacitance of the capacitor when there is a dielectric in between the plates to the capacitance of the capacitor that does not have a dielectric in between its plates. In other words, defining it, the relative permittivity is the ratio of the capacitance of a capacitor with the dielectric. Relative permittivity is the ratio of the, cap the capacitance of the capacitor with the dielectric between the plates to the capacitance of the capacitor when there is no dielectric between its plates. The relative permittivity is going to be equal to the capacitance of the capacitor when there is a dielectric in between, which is that, to the capacitance of the capacitor when there is no dielectric in between. And that is going to be that is going to be equal to this is the capacitance of the capacitor when there is no dielectric in between, which is uh, the permittivity of that dielectric multiplied by the area, divide that by the distance of separation between the two, divide that by the capacitance of the same capacitor when there is no dielectric in between. And when there is no dielectric in between, we are having epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space, divide, multiply that by the area of the same capacitor, divide that by D, the distance of separation. So when we divide those two expressions, we shall end up with the, a ratio when the, or the permittivity of the dielectric to the permittivity of free space. So meaning that is and an, uh, the expression for relative permittivity. So in other words, this brings us to a conclusion that the relative permittivity is the ratio of the permittivity of a substance, which is that, this is the relativity of a substance, to the permittivity of free space. And permittivity of free space is what has been denoted as by epsilon naught. And then two, relative permittivity has no units, and relative permittivity of free space is always equal to 1. Dielectric strength. Let's look at this more like tensile strength. Or you look, you're having a material and you have loaded it with some bit of load. Of course, if the material is elastic, it will endure, it will keep extending, it will be extending because it is elastic. But then it will reach a point whereby it won't be elastic anymore, it can't stretch anymore. And as a result, it loses its elasticity and it breaks. Or it, it's either, it loses its elasticity and if you continue imposing that load on it, it will eventually break. That is in mechanics. Now, relate that to this dielectric strength. We have dielectric, we, sometimes we, we shall put these insulators we call dielectrics in between the plates of a power plate capacitor. Now, these insulators also have got strength. A, a limit to their strength. So now if we are defining what the electric strength is in simple terms, we shall simply say that it is the measure of the electrical strength of the material 
as an insulator or we can say that the electric strength is defined as uh, the maximum voltage that is required to produce a dielectric breakdown through the material and this voltage that is required to break down this insulation is expressed in terms of volts per unit thickness so in simple terms you can say that the maximum voltage that can be applied to a material before it breaks down is what we are calling dielectric strength and by definition we can also refer to it as the potential gradient at which the insulation of the dielectric material breaks down and the spark passes through it let's examine the effect of a dielectric on the capacitance of a capacitor or a parallel plate capacitor now when we put a dielectric between a parallel plate capacitor into the gaps of a parallel plate capacitor how does this dielectric affect the capacitance now here we are having a capacitor with two plates this is a negatively charged plate and this is a positively charged plate there is no dielectric in between the plates so it means that in between the plates there is a field and this field is acting in that direction and we have called that field EO E subscript O that's the field between the plates now we are going to introduce a dielectric in between these two plates now when you introduce a dielectric or an insulator in between the plates what happens initially uh, this dielectric has got its molecules inside it that are random but then when we introduce these molecules into this field E naught these molecules are going to be polarized so when they are polarized you'll find that near the surface of the dielectric the surface that is next to the positive plate we shall have uh, molecules that are polarized in such a way that electrons will be attracted at this end likewise on the port on the on the negative plate near the surface will have positive charges on the surface of the dielectric so what does this mean it means that we are having now two fields the first the, we have a field that is due to the plates and then now we are having a field that is being brought about by the polarization of the dielectric but the field that is being brought about by the polarization of the dielectric is acting in the opposite direction to the field due to the plates how we all know that the field moves from positive to negative this is the positive plate that's the negative plate and so the field due to the plate is going to move from this direction in that direction and we are calling that field E naught but then when we introduce the dielectric into the into the in between the plates and we, we find that this positive induces a negative charge negative charges on the surface of this of this dielectric as a result of polarization of the molecules inside the dielectric likewise this negative is going to induce a positive charge on the surface of the dielectric so it means that you're having a dielectric that is polarized with a negative on the surface this way and the positive on the surface that way so what does that mean it means that there's going to be a field that is created inside in between the plates which we are calling ep but this field is acting in the opposite direction to this one the field due to the plates because this ep it's from positive to negative so the field acts in that direction so what does that mean it means that we are having two fields we are having a field acting in that direction we are having another field in the same space that is acting in the opposite direction so it means at the end of the day we are going to get a resultant field uh, as a result of these two so the resultant field we get after this field cancels out with that one is going to be less than the actual field that is supposed to be here so how this does this affect the capacitance of this capacitor that's what we seek to explore we see that the field due to the plates e naught minus the field due to the due to the polarization of the molecules which we are calling ep is going to give us an effective an a resultant field er of course this effective field er will be less much less so after getting that effective field er which is much less from the 
equation for intensity of the parallel plate capacitor E is going to be V over D. Uh, getting the voltage here, making V the subject of the formula, we know that the voltage is going to be equal to E times D. Since the effective, redu the, the, the effective field or the effective intensity is going to reduce, it means that the value of V will reduce. I mean, if you look at this expression, the voltage between the plates is going to be equal to the intensity E times D. And we are having the intensity reducing because of this. So when the intensity reduces, it means that the amount of voltage between the plates is also going to reduce. So when V also reduces, how does that affect the capacitance? We know that capacitance is the charge per unit potential difference across the plates, like we have seen here. Capacitance C is going to be the charge per unit PD. Now, if this value of V has reduced, it means that it's going to increase the value of C. So since V reduces, capacitance will automatically increase. And so that is how the capacitance is affected by the dielectric. So, so meaning that if you introduce the dielectric in between the plates of a parallel plate capacitor, it's going to increase the capacitance. And that brings us to that conclusion that the capacitance of a capacitor C will increase with the existence of a dielectric. Just like resistors, capacitors can, either, can also be arranged either in series or in pair. Today, we get to look at how these capacitors and uh, capacitors are arranged. So let's look at capacitors in parallel. When capacitors are arranged in parallel, the key, just like in resistors, the potential difference across these capacitors in parallel is the same. Just like in resistors, the potential difference across resistors in parallel is the same. Now, of these, on all these plates, there is a positive and negative induced on either plates. From this side, for example, looking at this negative terminal, all the electrons from here will be repelled. When these electrons are repelled, they reach this junction, and when they reach this junction, they are redistributed. They are distributed to C1, to C2, to C3. And so it means that our negative charges are induced this side. So looking at it from this side of the capacitors, this is a positive terminal of the cell. So it means this positive terminal of the cell is going to attract electrons from these terminals. When these electrons are attracted from these terminals, they are going to be attracted in that direction. Electrons will flow in this direction. So when the electrons flow in that direction, it means that we are going to have a negative. We are we are having positive plates this side and unequal but opposite negative charge is going to be induced on these plates. And these are the charges we are calling Q1, Q2, and Q3. So it, for the, the current that is inducing this is the same. It's coming from this. It means that for us to get the total charge that is induced here, Q1, plus the charge that is induced here, Q2, plus the charge that is induced here, Q3, is going to be equal to the total charge in the whole circuit because the total charge is being induced by the same current. So the total charge that would have been induced by this same current that is traveling here from positive to negative is going to be equal to the charge that has been induced here by that current that has been split due to Q1, Q2, and Q3. So in essence, or in other words, the total current in this, the total charge in this whole circuit, capital Q, is going to be equal to Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3. But we all know that Q is going to be the capacitance of the capacitor C times the voltage. So Q1 is going to be C1 times V. Q2 is going to be C2 times V. Q3 is going to be C3 times V. We notice that the Vs are the same. Why? Because we said that because the capacitors are in parallel, their potential difference is the same. So the potential difference is the same. And so these Vs will cancel out. And we'll find that uh, we'll remain with an expression for capacitance of capacitors in parallel being C being equal to C1 plus C2 plus C3. Now let's get to look at capacitors that are in series.
Now for capacitors that are in series, they have more or less a source of voltage, V0, and that is how they are positioned. Now, we are going to have the same current, just if these were resistors, it would mean that we are having the same current traveling from the positive uh, terminal moving through. It's the same current all through. That's the key. So here, uh, and with resistors, we said that it's going to be the same current. It means it's going to be the same even with capacitors. It's going to be the same current moving through. So it means that as this current is moving through, coming, it's come here, uh, this being the positive terminal, electrons are going to be attracted from this. And when these electrons are attracted, they are going to induce a positive charge there. Positive charges will be left here as electrons are attracted towards the positive terminal of the cell. So when a positive charge is induced here, unequal but opposite charge is induced on the other plate, which is the negative. Same here, a positive charge is induced here, unequal but opposite charge is induced in the, in the other plate. A positive charge is induced here, unequal, and opposite charge is induced there. And the chain continues. This being a negative charge, it's going to repel electrons and that are going to come to this plate, making it predominantly negatively charged. So what does that mean? It means that the charge in this capacitor is going to, the value of that is the value of Q, is going to be equal to the charge in this capacitor, which is the same, as also the charge in that capacitor, the value of Q. But then, the potential difference in the whole circuit, which is V0, is going to be the different. For us to get the total potential difference in this whole circuit, V0, it's going to be equal to the potential difference across the first capacitor plus the potential difference across the second capacitor plus the potential difference across the third capacitor. It is just like when we are trying to find the total voltage in a, in a circuit where there are resistors. The total PD or the EMF of the cell is going to be equal to the EMF of the resistor 1 plus resistor 2 plus resistor 3. That is when you are trying to find the total PD for resistors that are in series. So there is a relationship here. It's the same with capacitors in series. So what does that mean? So this will be our beginning point. That for us to get the potential difference in this whole circuit, it's going to be the potential difference across the first capacitor plus the potential difference across the second capacitor plus the potential difference across the third capacitor. And that is what we have done here. V0 is going to be equal to VA, which, which is potential difference across the first capacitor. We've called it VA plus the potential difference across the second capacitor plus that across the third. But from our formula, that charge is going to be equal to CV, meaning if we make the V the subject of the formula, it will mean that our value of V, the potential difference, is going to be equal to the charge Q over C. So we substitute this in this expression. So we'll end up with V0, which is the, the charge in the whole circuit, divide that by the effective capacitance of the entire circuit, is going to be equal to Q, that is the charge in with the, the, the charge in the first in the first capacitor over C1 plus Q over C2 plus Q over C3. This is C1, C2, C3. Now, like we had said, that the charge in all these is the same. It's the same charge that is induced throughout the whole circuit. So that's why the the Qs are the same. But the Cs are different. We have C, C1, C2, C3. So the capacitances are different. So these Qs will cancel out since they are the same and we we'll get an expression for our the, the effective capacitance of the capacitors in series as being 1 over C, being equal to 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus 1 over C3. So these things have a relationship. We are required to calculate the charge on C1 and C2 and the PD across each. So we are having two capacitors here. We want to find uh, the charge that is on these capacitors C1 and C2. Let's call this C1. 
Let's call this C2. And we are required to find the charge on both of them. Now, in our previous tutorial, we said that when capacitors are in series, the charge is going to be the same. Why? Because we said that if this is a positive terminal, and we are having uh, this capacitor connected to this side of this terminal, this positive terminal is going to attract electrons from here. When it attracts electrons from here, it means that a, a positive charge is going to be induced here since there will be positive charges here. Likewise, this being a negative terminal of this cell, it means that it's going to repel electrons from here and there, there will be an excess of electrons on this plate. So it means there will be an excess of negative an, an excess of negative electrons here. So it means electrons here actually. So it means that there will be an H, uh, negative charge induced here and an equal but opposite charge will be induced here. A negative charge will be induced here and an equal but positive charge is already induced here. So it means that the charge here and the charge there is all going to be the same. So we are required to calculate the charge on C1 and C2 which is going to be the same and then afterwards we find the PD across each of them. Now the total PD in this whole circuit is 90 volts. So it means that the total PD 90 volts here is going to be equal to the PD across that plus the PD across that. That is for these capacitors in series, just like they would do it when we are dealing with the resistors in series. So we'll begin with our calculation to try and find, calculate the charge on these capacitors. Now for us to find the charge on each of those capacitors, in essence, they're asking us to find the value of Q. And we know that Q is going to be equal to C times V, which is the... So to find the total charge of in this whole circuit, because the total charge in this whole circuit is the same charge here, it's the same charge that has been induced here. So the total charge should be equal to the capacitance of the whole circuit, which is the effective capacitance, times the voltage in the whole circuit, which in this case is the EMF, which is 90 volts. Now we still happen to have the 90 volts, which is the V, which is there. So it means we need to first find the effective capacitance in this whole circuit so that we're able to get the charge in the whole circuit. So we begin with our calculations by first finding the effective capacitance. For us to get our effective capacitance from our derivations before we said that for, for capacitors that are in series 1 over C, which is the effective capacitance going to be equal to 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2. And we have one of our capacitors as 3 microfarads, so it's 1 over 3 microfarads, which is 3 times 10 to the power negative 6, plus 1 over C2 is 6, so it is 6 times 10 to the power negative 6 farads. That is going to be equal to 1 over C. So it means that our effective capacitance is going to be 2 times 10 to the power negative 6 which is the same as saying 2 microfarads. So that is the effective capacitance in this whole thing. So now after getting our effective capacitance, we have our total PDF in the whole circuit, which is 90 volts, so we can get the total charge. And calculating that charge means that we have, it's the same charge for C1 and C2. So it means that our total charge Q is going to be the capa effective capacitance times the voltage we got our effective capacitance as 2 microfarads, so it's going to be 2 microfarads. Multiply that by 90 volts, which is our effective EMF. And so our answer there is going to be, this is the same as saying 2 times microfarads is times 10 to the power negative 6 farads times 90 volts. So our answer is going to be 180 times 10 to the power negative 6 coulombs. So that is the charge. So 180 microcoulombs is, in essence, the charge here and in, in this capacitor, and it's the amount of charge in that capacitor. So it is one key thing that we should all know, that for capacitors that are in series, the total charge in the whole circuit is the same for every capacitor. So we go on to the next part of our question. They're asking us to find the potential difference across each of these. 
Still, we are going to be basing on this. They want us to find the PD across this and the PD across that. So it means if we make V the subject of the formula, it's going to be V is going to be is equal to Q over C. Now, so we, for us to get the PD across this is going to be V is going to be equal to Q, the total charge, which we have already gotten, divided by the capacitance of this capacitor, which is 3 microfarads, and we get our V. We, can, we shall do the same story here. So we begin. So for us to get the potential difference across C1, our potential difference V is going to be equal to Q over C. So what is Q? We already got our Q from our previous question. Our Q is 180 times 10 to the power negative 6 coulombs. So it means that it's going to be 180 times 10 to the power negative 6. Divide all that by the capacitance of C1. The capacitance of C1 is 3 micro coulombs. So it is 3 times 10 to the power negative 6. So we end up with 60 volts. So it means that the PD across C1 is 60 volts. What about the PD across C2? Now, remember I said that the PD, the total PD which is 90 volts for this is going to be equal to the PD across that plus the PD across that for series arrangement. So it means for us to find the PD across this, it is as simple as saying 90 volts minus the PD across this so that we're able to get the PD across that. So it would mean that PD across C2 would mean it's the total PD which is 90 volts minus the PD across that which is going to which is 60 and when we do that we, are, we shall end up with 30 volts as our answer or you can still use the same formula here and you're still supposed to get the same answer we can still say that V is going to be equal to Q over C and that's going to be equal to the total charge which is 180 times 10 to the power negative 6 divide that by the capacitance which is 6 microfarads that's going to be 6 times 10 to the power negative 6 and 180 times 6 we will end up getting our answer being 30 volts we'll do one more act example in this question below, we are being required to calculate the charges on the capacitors and the PD across each. We are having a circuit that is having 120 volts as its EMF. That is the, we are having a cell with 120 volts as its EMF. We are having this capacitor being in series with this parallel combination. So if you are to calculate the charges on the capacitor, it would mean that the charge that is on in the whole circuit is the same as the charge that is induced in this capacitor and it is the same charge that is induced on this parallel combination but first uh, before we are we get the charges on the capacitors on each of those capacitors let us first find the effective capacitance in the whole circuit Getting the effective capacitance in the whole circuit means that we have to first find the, eff the effective capacitance of this parallel combination so that we have one, the effective capacitance of this parallel combination and this capacitance, we combine them and we are able to get the effective capacitance of the whole circuit. So first, let's first get the effective capacitance of that. From our, we know that these two capacitors are in parallel. So if they're in parallel, it means that for us to get the capacitance of the capacitors in parallel, C is going to be equal to C1 plus C2 plus C3. Parallel combination of capacitors. We did this in our previous tutorials. So it means that to get this effective capacitance for the parallel combination, for the parallel combination, effective capacitance, let's call it CY, the effective capacitance here. Cy is going to be 2 microfarads plus the 4 microfarads and our total answer there is 6 microfarads that is the effective capacitance for y, our Cy 
So after getting our effective capacitance for CY, it means that our diagram becomes like this. Right here we have our 120 volts. This CY, this is CY, and it is six microfarads, and this is X. Capacitance of X, and it is three microfarads. So now we go ahead and find. Now it means that we have two capacitors that are in series. Now we need to find the effective capacitance of the two, and from Effective capacitance for capacitors in series from our previous tutorials we said that for capacitors that are in series The effective capacitance 1 over C is going to be equal to 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2 plus 1 over C3 So for us to get the effective capacitance there So meaning our effective capacitance which we shall call 1 over capital C is going to be equal to 1 over Cx plus 1 over Cy our 1 over C is going to be equal to 1 over Cx. What is Cx? Is 3 microfarads plus 1 over Cy, which is 6 microfarads. So when we add up the two, our final answer is going to be 2 microfarads. That is. Our question is telling us to calculate the charges on the capacitors. So we go ahead and calculate the charges on the capacitors here. So after getting that, it means we can get calculate the charge on each capacitor. Our charge Q is going to be equal to C times V. So the charge in the capacitor, it means we are looking for the charge in the whole circuit, is going to be the effective capacitance in the whole circuit times the potential difference of the whole circuit. So in this case, it's going to be 2 microfarads. Multiply that by the voltage in the whole circuit, which is 120. And so it means that it's going to end up being, we shall end up with 240 times 10 to the power negative 6 coulombs. Now this 240 times 10 to the power negative 6 coulombs is the charge in the whole circuit. So meaning as of this, this 240 times 10 to the power negative 6 is the charge across Cx. And this 240 times 10 to the power negative 6 is the same charge across the effective parallel combination. So, to answer this question, here, they're asking us to calculate the charges on the capacitors below. To calculate the charges, so we've got the charges on the charge on Cx. The charge on Cx is 240 times 10 to the power negative 6. Then now, the charge on Cy is also going to be 240 times 10 to the power 6. That is as per capacitors that are in series. But we know that Cy is... A derivation of two capacitors that have been in power. Now for us to get the charges of these individual capacitors, their, their, their total charges combined is 240 times 10 to the power negative 6. But individually it is actually not the case. Individually this capacitor has a different charge from that one. But if we sum the two up, it is supposed to give us 240 times 10 to the power 6. But since the question is asking us to calculate the charges on the capacitors, so it means we're supposed to go ahead and find the charge on each of those individual capacitors. So how can we find those charges on each of those individual capacitors? We'll still find use Q is going to be C times V. We'll still use that formula. Yes, do we have the Q? This is what we are looking for for each of these individual capacitors that are in parallel. Do we have the capacitance of each of these years? This is 2 microfarads and this is 4 microfarads. But do we have the voltage across this combination? We do not know. So meaning that if we set out to find the voltage across this parallel combination, we shall be able to find that voltage across here because it's the same. Multiply that by the capacitance of each of those in the each case so that we're able to find the charge in each of those capacitors. Now, take note also that this being 120 volts, is this 120 volts is equivalent to the PD across this plus the PD across that. So meaning that if we also know the PD across this capacitor, it's a matter of saying 120 volts minus the PD across that capacitor and we're able to get the PD across this combination. So now let's get to work and try and find the potential or the PD across 
x first. So for us to get the PD across capacitor x, which is that one, we know that Q is going to be equal to CV. So it means that the PD across x is going to be equal to Q over C. That is going to be, what is the charge? We already got the charge on that one. We got the charge as 240 times 10 to the power negative 6. So it's going to be 240 times 10 to the power negative 6. Divide all that by the capacitance of that capacitor, which is 3 microfarads, which is 3 times 10 to the power negative 6. And we shall end up getting our, our voltage as 80 volts. So now that 80 volts, that is the potential difference that is across capacitor X. So if the potential difference across this is 80, it means we can get the potential difference across this combination. It's a matter of saying 120 minus that to get that. So it means that the potential difference across Y, uh, potential difference V across Y is going to be equal to the total PD or the EMF of that cell, which is 120 minus the PD across this which is 80 and by so doing we are able to get the PD across this combination which is 40 volts so the PD across that combination because uh, capacitors that are in parallel have got the same potential difference so the PD across this combination is 40 volts after getting the PD across the 40 uh, across this combination so it means you can go ahead and get the charge that is resident in each of these so to get that charge that is resident in each of that, we know that our value, to, to answer the remaining part of the question, our value of Q is going to be equal to CV. So to get Q of this first combination, the, the, the charge here is going to be the capacitance, which is 2 microfarads, multiply that by the potential difference across it, which is 40. And by so doing, we are able to get 80 times 10 to the power negative 6 coulombs that is q1 let's call this 1 let's call this 2 so to get the charge in q2 it's the same story we are going to use c times v capacitance times voltage the capacitance of this second one is 4 micro coulombs for its 4 micro i mean microfarads times the voltage which is still 40 and we shall end up with 40 times 40 which is 160 times 10 to the power negative 6 coulombs so in so doing we are able to find the charge in that and the charge in that so we get the charge on Q1 plus the charge on Q2 giving us 160. This, this is 80 volts and this is 160 volts. And if you look at it closely, you will realize we got the total charge looking at this. The total charge in the whole circuit was 240 times 10 to the power negative 6 coulombs. And we said that this is the same. It's always the same charge for uh, capacitors that are in series. We say that it's 240 in here and it's 240 there. But this 240 is being shared between two, between two capacitors that are in parallel. We have got the charge that is resident on Q1, which is 80 times 10 to the power negative 6. We have got the charge which is resident on 2, which is 160 times 10 to the power negative 6. And if you added these two, 160 plus 80, it is going to still give us the total charge which is 240 times 10 to the power negative 6. Energy stored in a charged capacitor. Now previously we talked about how we charge a capacitor and in our explanation for charging a capacitor we said that when we put a capacitor like this in series with a resistor and we connect an ammeter and we connect this to a source of EMF uh, we say that this negative terminal is going to repel electrons and so there will be flow of electrons that are going to be repelled and they'll accumulate on this plate. Likewise, we also say that this positive terminal is going to attract 
electrons from this plate and so electrons will be attracted towards the positive terminal leaving an excess of positive charges here now what exactly happens here is that when these electrons are being repelled towards this plate they do work against the repulsive forces of the electrons that are already there likewise when this positive terminal is attracting electrons from this plate from the positive plate so that they come this way it is going to the, the electrons that are being attracted from here are working against the, re, the attractive forces of the positive charges that are already here now that work that is being done by these positive charges against uh, against the electrons that are being attracted by this positive terminal and also the work that is being done against the repulsive forces of the existing electrons here due to these electrons that are coming in that work that is being done is what is actually being stored in the field and that work is stored in form of electrical potential energy so now let us consider a capacitor like this one here this capacitor has got a capacitance c it has got a capacitance c and it has also got charge on its plates let's call the charge q now let's assume that this capacitor has been partially charged now if if so it has been partially charged to a charge let's say q now let's assume also now that this charge that is partially has increased slightly by a small charge which we shall call dq now if this capacitor was initially charged to partially by q and now it has been charged its charge has been increased by a small charge called dq now this in, this small increment in the charge is going to increase involve movement of charge from one plate to another so if this change this small increment in the charge is so small then we shall assume that uh, the potential difference across the capacitor has not been affected as a result so that brings us to this that if that small increment in charge is so small then the potential difference can be considered to be unchanged or constant and by this process in which case work done will be given by v times that ch the small change in work that is happening will be equal to the potential difference which we are assuming that is unchanged multiply that by the change in q now where, where is work done w is equal to vq where is that coming from I, we said that potential difference is the work done per unit charge potential is the work done per unit charge so when we make uh, w the work the subject of the formula that is how we end up with uh, this expression that the work done the small work is equal to potential difference times uh, the small increment or the charge the small increment in the charge so now but for capacitors we know that uh, potential difference v between the plates is going to be equivalent to q over c so it means we are going to substitute for the value of v in this expression when we substitute this expression in v here we end up with work done is going to be equal to q over c so now if the total work done for that increment it is uh, so it means we are going to now if we, we are we are if we are talking about a small increment in the charge now what if this increment in charge let's say the capacitor was previously having no charge so meaning it's having zero charges and then it was full it was full, it was charged to full capacity maybe it was charged to value q so for us to be able to find the work done in charging that capacitor from zero up to q which is when it is at full capacity it means we are going to integrate this expression here with respect to q and our limits will be that we are charging this capacitor from zero up to q and then we will be able to find the work done in charging a capacitor fully and in, in integrating both sides of this expression we shall be able to find 
the expression for work done. So work done W in increasing charge from 0 to Q will be this. So the work done is going to be V times dQ. And in the place of V, we substituted Q over C. Because V is equal to Q over C for capacitors. Times the change in Q. So meaning we are going to integrate this expression with respect to Q. With our limits being, we are charging the thing from 0 up to Q. Up to charge Q when it is fully charged. And the work done is from 0 up to W. Work done. So integrating will give us work done being equal to 1 over C. Since we are integrating with respect to Q, it means it's going to be 1 and C are constant, so we bring them out of the integral sign and we only integrate this. So it's going to become, integrating this, we are, it is to the power 1. So for us to integrate, it's going to be, we are going to add 1 to the numerator and the answer we get here, we divide by the whole term. And uh, we'll end up with our work done for uh, being Q squared over 2C. That will be our first expression for work. Now, if we are to substitute the value of Q, remember for capacitors, the charge Q is going to be equal to the capacitance times the potential difference. So Q is equal to CV. So if you are to substitute for CV in this here, so me, so that work becomes CV, C squared, V squared over 2C. We'll end up with another expression for work done, which is W is equal to CV squared over 2. That's our second expression. Then also, if we want to substitute for the value of c you know c is going to be q over v if we to substitute for the value of c here it would mean that we'll come up with another expression for work which is going to be qv over 2 so those three are our three expressions for work the first one the second one and the third one those are our three expressions for work done in a capacitor Joining two capacitors. Today we get to look at what happens when we join two capacitors. The diagram on your screen is showing capacitor C1 and capacitor C2. When we close switch S, these two capacitors are joined together. Now, we may have a capacitor C1 having a certain amount of charge on its plates. We are having a capacitor C2 um, having a certain amount of charge as well. When we connect these two capacitors, if we are having a capacitor with a higher potential difference than the other, it means charge will flow, flow from the plates that are having a higher potential difference towards the capacitor whose potential difference is low. And charge will stop flowing when the potential difference across these capacitors becomes the same. In other words, these two capacitors have been connected in parallel. They've been connected in parallel, and when we connect them, charge will flow from a capacitor with a higher potential difference to a capacitor with a lower potential difference. And when it, it, it so happens, it does so to the point that the potential difference across C1 and the potential difference across C2 becomes the same. So when that happens, charge stops flowing. Now, the final potential difference and the energy of each capacitor will be calculated. We shall calculate this in our worked example that we are about to do. But the, thing, the three things we should put in mind here are that one, that these capacitors, first of all, have been connected in power. And then the other issue we need to put in mind is that for this charge that has been flowing from one capacitor to the other to stop flowing, it would mean that the potential difference across this capacitor and the potential difference across that capacitor have been the same. In other words, what we are trying to say here is that uh, the charges flow so that they normalize the potential difference. Then also we'll be able to see that the energy that was stored initially and the energy that is stored after the two capacitors have been connected will be different it will be less now why is that so because when this charge is flowing for example when charge is flowing from one capacitor to the other so that the potential difference across both capacitors is normalized as that process is continuing uh, some of the energy is dissipated as heat in these connecting wires 
So that energy that is dissipated as heat in the connecting wires as charge is flowing is what is responsible for the decrease in stored energy after we connect the two capacitors. We look at a worked example to demonstrate this further. A 5 microfarad capacitor X is charged by a 40 volt supply. It is then connected across an uncharged 20 microfarad capacitor Y. They are asking us to calculate the final potential difference across each, the final charge of each and the initial and final energy. This is the capacitor we are talking about. It is having a capacitance of 5 microfarads. Now a 5 microfarad capacitor X is charged by a 40 volt supply. So it means it has been charged by a 40 volt supply. And it is then connected across an uncharged 20 microfarad capacitor. So this is 5, five microfarads. It has been connect, charged by 40 volts. Now we are charging this capacitor we shall call C1. And we are connecting it to another uncharged 20 microfarad capacitor we shall call Y. So this thing was initially 5 microfarads and it's charged by 40 volt supply. So we'll call it, this is a 5 microfarad capacitor. It has been connected to an uncharged 20 microfarad capacitor. So this is the 20 microfarad farad capacitor. This is a 5 microfarad capacitor. It has been charged by a 40 volt supply. Now we get this 5 microfarad capacitor that has been charged. And we have connected it to a 20 microfarad capacitor, which is uncharged. So what happens? What happens is that charge will flow from this capacitor to this. And the reason as to why it will flow is so that the potential difference across this capacitor and that capacitor is normalized. When the two potential differences now become the same, then charge will stop flowing. So now they are asking us to calculate the potential difference, the final potential difference across each. Now we know that the final potential difference across this capacitor and that capacitor will be the same. So we set out to start calculating it and so we get to work. Now for us to find the final potential difference, we know that V is going to be equal to Q over C. So for us to find the potential difference, the effective potential, the potential difference across each capacitor, we need to find the total charge in the whole circuit. And we also need to find the effective capacitance in the whole circuit. Now remember, we do not know the effective capacitance. Uh, do, we do not know the charge, the total charge in the system. So before we find V, we need to first find Q, we need to first find C. But remember, before this capacitor was connected to this one, which is not charged, this thing had been charged. C1 had been charged by a 40 volt supply here. So meaning that for us to find the total charge in this whole system, we need to find the charge that is resident in the five microfarad capacitor when it had been charged by the 40 volt supply. Cause it is this charge that was brought into this circuit with this not having any charge. So since this didn't have any charge, it means that the total charge in this whole circuit is the charge that had been charged by this 40 volts. So to first find that charge, we know Q is going to be equal to CV. So our capacitance here is 5 microfarad, so it's 5 times 10 to the power negative 6. Multiply that by the voltage that was charging, which is 40. And we shall end up with 200 times 10 to the power negative 6 coulombs. So I mean we have our value of Q, it is 200 times 10 to the power negative 6 coulombs. So now we need to find the effective capacitance in the whole system. Now these are two capacitors in parallel. Since there are two capacitors in parallel, it means the effective capacitance is going to be equal to effective capacitance will be this plus that. So it's going to be C1 plus C2 and that's going to be 5 microcoulombs plus 20 microcoulombs. And our answer here is simple. It is going to be 25 micro. It is microfarads. So it's going to be 25 microfarads. That's the effective capacitance. 
So after finding the effective capacitance, so we can go ahead and find the potential difference across each capacitor. So the potential difference, therefore, across each capacitor is going to be the charge, which we already got as 200 times 10 to the power negative 6 microcoulombs. Divide that by the 25 microcoulombs. So it's 25 microcoulombs. It's 25 times 10 to the power negative 6. It's microfarads. I keep making that error. So it's microfarads. And here it is 200 times 10 to the power negative 6 coulombs. And so meaning from there we shall get our final answer as 8 volts. We have answered part of the question. The final PD across each. So it means that when we connect those two, the final potential difference across each capacitor is 8 volts. So we'll go ahead and find the final charge on each capacitor. So for us to calculate the final charge on each capacitor, the final charge Q, we know that Q is going to be the capacitance of each capacitor. Multiply that by the potential difference across, across each capacitor. We know that the potential difference across each capacitor is um, 8 volts. And we know that each capacitor has got its own capacitance. So to find the charge on each of them, remember the charge redistributed itself in an effort to normalize the PD across each. So Q1... The charge across capacitor 1, we know that capacitor 1 has got 5 microcoulombs, so it's going to be 5 microcoulombs. Multiply that by multiply that by the PD, which is 8, and we'll end up with 40 microcoulombs. Then the charge across capacitor 2, which is, is still going to be C times V, the capacitance of that is 20 microcoulombs, so it's going to be 20 microcoulombs times 10 to the power negative 6. Multiply that by the potential difference, which is 8. Capacitance for C1 is 5 microfarads, not microcoulombs. Like I, I had said earlier, excuse me for that error. And we shall end up with 160 micro. Columns. And if you will see, when we add up 160 microcoulombs plus 40 microcoulombs, it's going to give us um, 200 microcoulombs, which is the total charge in the whole system. So that is, we've answered Roman 2 of the question. Find the final charge on each. So Roman 3 of the question is requiring us to find the initial and final energies in the system in the two capacitors that had been connected. Now we know that the initial energy, let's call that U, or the initial energy is the same as the work done. It is going to be equal to a half C V squared. We derived these equations in the previous tutorial. So initial energy is a half C V squared. Now the initial energy is the energy that was contained by that capacitor C1 which was charged. This one was uncharged so it didn't have any energy in it. This one had been charged by 40 volt supply so that is, so we calculate the initial energy of that one. The initial energy is this that had been charged by the 40 volts, this capacitor that had been charged by the 40 volt supply. So the initial energy that was maintained here, contained here, which was brought into this system which was when this capacitor was connected to this that had not been charged, is going to be equal to a half times the capacitance of that, which is 5 microfarad, 5 times 10 to the power negative 6. Multiply that by the voltage across the combination, which is 40. And uh, our initial energy there is going to be 4 times 10 to the power to the power negative 3 joules. That's our initial energy. Now let's calculate our final energy because the question is asking us to initial and final energies. So what is our final energy? Calculating our final energy means you're going to find the energy that is possessed by the first capacitor C1 when it had been connected plus energy in C2. So final energy is going to be a half times C1 V squared plus a half times C2 
v squared. So that's going to be a half times our first capacitor, which is that, times 5 times 10 to the power negative 6, times v squared. The potential difference across this is, remember when we closed the potential difference, the, when charge flew, the potential difference across the two became 8 volts. So it's going to be times 8 squared plus a half times C2, C2 is 20 microfarads, times 20, times 10 to the power negative 6, times 8 squared. So we'll end up with that total energy being 0 0.8, times 10 to the power negative 3 joules. So we have answered this question, the initial and final energies. If you look at our initial energy, it is 4 times 10 to the power negative 3 joules. Our final energy is 0 0.8 times 10 to the power negative 3 joules. Now, why is it that our initial energy is higher than our final energy? At first, we got a 5 microfarad capacitor. We charged it with a 40 volt source. And it acquired, when we charged it, it acquired our initial energy, which is 4 times 10 to the power negative 3 joules. And now... We get this 5 microfarad capacitor and we connect it to another capacitor, which is a 20 microfarad capacitor. But this 20 microfarad capacitor that we have connected to this capacitor was initially not charged, meaning it didn't have any energy that it was storing. So what happens? What happens is that charge flows from this capacitor to that capacitor until the potential difference across these two capacitors becomes the same. And when the, the potential difference across these two capacitors becomes the same in our calculations we find that actually the potential difference now becomes 8 volts across that and it is also 8 volts across this so when we go ahead and calculate for the final energy that is stored in this system we find that the final energy is 0 0.8 times 10 to the power negative 3 joules which is a bit less than the 4 times 10 which was initially there so now the explanation for this is that the energy dissipated as heat in the connecting wires when the charges flow from the 5 microfarad capacitor to the 20 microfarad capacitor accounts for the decrease in the stored energy. The power plate capacitors, one with air and the other with mica, are identical in all aspects. The air capacitor is charged from a 400 volt DC supply, isolated and then connected across a mica capacitor, which is initially uncharged. The potential difference across this terminal combination is 50 volts. So assuming that the relative permittivity of air is 1, calculate the relative permittivity of mica. Now the question here is they are asking us to calculate the relative permittivity of mica. Let's ask, what is relative permittivity? To we remind ourselves, first of all, relative permittivity is the ratio of the capacitance of a capacitor with the dielectric between its plates to the capacitance of a capacitor without the dielectric between the plates. That is the definition for relative permittivity. So it means for us to find the relative permittivity of mica means that we need to get the ratio it is it is as simple as getting the ratio of the capacity of the capacitance of the capa, of the mica cap, of the capacitor with this mica to the capacitance of the same capacitor without the mica in between that means with uh, with a vacuum in between its plates so let's get started we interpret the question in the with, with the diagram we are having two capacitors here. They are telling us that the power plate capacitors, one with air, we are calling one with air C, A, A standing for air. One with air and another with mica. So one with air, we are calling it C, A. The other one with mica, we are calling it C, M. So now, these are power plate capacitors. One with air and the other with mica. They are identical in all aspects. If they are identical in all aspects, it would mean, it simply means that they are having the same Capacitance. Okay, so the air capacitor is charged with from a 400 volt DC supply. 
so this is before this connection took place this air capacitor was charged with the at with the 400 dc supply and it uh, isolated and then connected across the mica capacitor which is initially uncharged so this mica capacitor here initially does not have charge so we get this capacitor of this air capacitor that has been charged from a 400 volt dc supply and it is connected in parallel with a, a capacitor with the mica as a dielectric which we are calling a mica capacitor which is initially not charged so the pd across the terminal combination becomes 50 volts so meaning after connecting this to that uh the charges from here flow to this when the pd eventually normalizes and the the charges stop flowing the potential difference across this capacitor and that capacitor is said to be 50 volts now so now they're asking us that assuming that the relative permittivity of air is one calculate the relative permittivity of mica so we get to start working now now when they say that the uh, relative permittivity of air is one it means that uh the relative permittivity of air is remember relative permittivity of air means it is the capac the ratio of the capacitance of the capacitor with air in between its plates to the ratio of the capacitance of the capacitor when there is nothing when there is a vacuum in between the plates so it means in this case it is great let's call do not call that cv so the relative permittivity of air which is the ratio of the capacitance of the capacitor with air in between two the capacitance of the capacitor when there is nothing we shall we've called it when there is a vacuum when there is nothing is equal to one according to the question so meaning that this expression is same as saying one is equal to capacitance of the capacitor over capacitance of v so when we multiply cv on both sides it would mean that ca is the same as c v so they're asking us to calculate the relative permittivity of mica so calculate the relative permittivity of mica we also know that relative capacity relative permittivity of mica is going to be equal to the capacitance of the capacitor when there is mica in between to the capacitance of the capacitor when there is nothing we shall call that cv when there is nothing this was charged by 400 volt dc source then it was connected to this charge uncharged capacitor so it means that all the charge that was uh, generated here is what is here the total charge here meaning is going to be equal to the charge in the capacitor that has got air in between its plates plus the charge that has got mica in between its plates because when we get this capacitor and we connect it to this one the charge that had been accumulated here is redistributed between these two and the total charge here is the same as the charge that was accumulated here during this charging so we'll begin from that angle so the total charge here which we are going to call q is going to be equal to the charge that has been that is in the air capacitor plus the charge that is in the mica capacitor now the total charge in this whole combination is the charge that was accumulated when this air capacitor was being charged because remember we got this air capacitor connected it to this mica capacitor when there was nothing Ch no charge in this one this was on initially uncharged so it means that all the charge that had been accumulated by the air capacitor when the 400 dc source was charging it is the same charge the total charge in this whole system so it means that the total charge before connecting is going to be equal to the total charge after connecting so the total charge before connecting which we have called q is going to be equivalent to cv it's going to be ca times v is going to be equal to the charge that is in the air capacitor after connecting which is going to be ca times v plus the charge the total charge in the capacitor of the mica capacitor after connecting which is we are calling cm times v so we continue with our calculation we know that ca here before connecting ca is remaining as it is it's going to be ca multiply that by the potential difference which is going to be 400 is going to be equal to ca times v 
which is CA times V. Now the potential difference after connecting, according to the question, says that it is 550 volts. So it's going to be times 50 plus the capacitance of the maker. Multiply that by 50. So we end up with 400 CA giving us 50 CA plus 50 CM. When we divide through by 50, so when you divide through by 50, by 50, by 50, 8 CA, this, this by 50 once, by 58, so it means that 8 CA is going to be equal to CA plus CM. When we make CM the subject of this formula, we'll end up with 8 CA minus CA giving us 7 CA. So the, the, the capacitance of Mika is equivalent to 7 CA. But then the question here is requiring us to find the relative permittivity of Mika. And we said for us to get the relative permittivity of Mika, relative permittivity of Mika is going to be equal to the, cap the capacitance of the capacitor when there is Mika in between the plates to the capacitance of the capacitor when there is nothing. We've called that CV. So now, according to our calculation here, we have gotten our value of the capacitance of the Mika is equivalent to 7 CA. So we can go ahead and say it is 7 CA, divide that by the capacitance when there is nothing, CV. But then, from our information, from our question, we were told that the relative permittivity of air is 1. And we say that when relative permittivity of air is 1, we said that we ended up with an expression that CA is going to be equal to CV. So if we are having CV here and that, that same CV is going to be CA, it means that this can also turn into CA. So this is going to end up being 7CA, divide that by CA. When that cancels out, we remain with our the relative permittivity of Mika being 7. And that's our answer. That brings us to the end of this tutorial. Thanks for tuning in. For the benefit of your colleagues out there that would like to watch this tutorial, simply share the video. Otherwise, for more of these videos, I encourage you to subscribe. For Ksembo Academy, this is Arnold Rangakuran.